So let's talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. Here's what you really should do at this point. I've included in the slides just about everything that you might want to write down. I think there's one equation I'm going to add on the upcoming seven slides, and that's it. So if you want to just sit back and just put your pencil down and say, hey, I don't have to know this for the exam, and just get a little weirded out with the mystery that is quantum mechanics, that's totally fine. Yeah? Okay. You just lounge. Just go ahead and slide back and enjoy. If you must write things down, then I understand. I get it. Okay? Also, you may find spelling mistakes in here because you know that I posted this about, what, two and a half hours ago? This was a bit of a rush this morning, trying to get things put together and organized in a fashion that I thought would give you a decent overview and make some sense while leaving out a lot of complexity and details that I don't need to tell you, all right? So I'm sorry if there's a spelling mistake or if there's a word that's like, you know, obscene or something because of a spell. Just ignore it. I typed fast, all right? I don't know. I don't know what's in here. I haven't looked back through it. Could be anything, all right? So what is the overall idea of quantum mechanics? This was a new theory back in around 1930s, somewhere right in there, that was trying to fix the problems. First of all, we had wave-particle duality. It's like, ah, like it's, things aren't working. We've got two competing descriptions of what's happening. Both are right. And both are kind of wrong, because clearly they can't really both be correct. We need to merge that somehow. We have theories of the atom, like the Bohr theory, that kind of only partially fits, like it's okay for some things, but then there's a lot of stuff that it can't explain at all. We've got this idea of de Broglie's matter waves, and like, okay, that seems to be going okay, but there's all of this mess that needed explaining. It's new theories had to be developed, and that's where quantum mechanics came out of. So, in general, we're going to say that most of what we talk about is applying to what we would call the quantum world, things that are tiny, the world of the atom, all right? Um, as you get to larger and larger objects, like we saw with the de Broglie wavelength, like the effects really aren't a big deal. Those wavelengths get small. All of the quantum effects we talk about seem to sort of, like, disappear into the background a bit as you get larger and larger. The thing is, all of the equations that we're not going to deal with, like that really scary one in the middle of the screen right now, um, if you apply it and plug in values for large macroscopic objects, essentially the equations just transform into all the stuff that we talked about last semester. It's like they simplify, like there's all this complexity, plug in the right numbers, and it's like, blah, Newton's laws. Like, they simplify into what we learned about, what we would call classical physics. This is what's known as the correspondence principle. There needs to be a connection that, like, the same equations work, whether I'm talking about small stuff or big stuff. If there's a disconnect there, that implies there's something wrong with one theory or the other. So they continuously work across big things and small things. It's just you don't generally have to do the more complicated things if you're working with big objects. Now... The fit for de Broglie waves, all of that stuff that we were hinting at and talking about at the end of last chapter, in a more quantitative way, describing uh, what a de Broglie wave of a piece of matter looks like is described by the wave function, for lack of a better name. And it's given, I think that's psi, is that right? The Greek letter that's there? Help, Greek people. You're saying yes, but, you know. You might just be like, <laughs> let him go with it. It's wrong, but who cares? Psi, the wave function here, I've written it as a function of x and t, just to let you know that this is going to have position information and time information. So whatever this wave function thing is, it's a function of where the electron or where the particle is at and when it's at that location. Now, that's just one physical dimension, x. Really, if you wanted to do the full quantum physics, you should have x, y, and z, and work in three dimensions and time. That just adds a whole lot more complexity. And I've given you an equation below that we're going to talk about in a second that's just as a function of x and t instead of dealing with all the three dimensions. Okay? So what is the wave function? The wave function is the wave displacement or amplitude of the matter wave that we were talking about in the last chapter. So it's, in a way, if you were to compare it to like an electromagnetic wave, 
what represented amplitudes in the electromagnetic wave? What were the things that were pointing one direction and another direction? Yeah, electric fields and magnetic fields had certain amplitudes, right, that were away from the, the equilibrium point. Well, in a way, this is analogous to that. This is another type of field, if you wanted to think about it that way, that represents the field of matter, for lack of a better term. I'm sorry, I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Again, imagine that everything, instead of just being a fixed, discrete thing that you can hold, is something that's waving. There's a little bit of uncertainty there, and there's a displacement or an amplitude that goes along with that particle. So if I want to know anything about where the particle is at what time, that's what this matter, this wave function is going to give us. Sadly, you have to solve an equation that looks like that, which is known as the Schrodinger equation, and it is complicated, all right? If you wanted to add y and z in here, you're going to be adding some more partial derivatives, and all of a sudden it just gets bigger, and you're not going to have to do anything with that. I just want you to know the name and what it looks like, just to give you a little tease of kind of what's out there. Or if you're watching some good sci-fi and they mention this, you're like, ah, I've heard of that. I know what they're talking about, all right? Now, let me point out how important this equation is. Newton's laws were important. Newton's second law, terribly important. But also, F equals MA wasn't something that was derived. Instead, it was just like directly invented to explain experiments and observations. It doesn't come from like more fundamental principles. It like is at the bottom. It's like boom, F equals MA. This is another one of those equations. Like we have all of this experimental data, we need to explain it, boom. We invented a new equation that's not derived from other principles. It's fundamental, it's made up, and it's completely been verified by experiments. Like, so it's not like we made it up and eh, maybe it works. No, it fits perfectly with all the observations that have been done. So it's powerful in a lot of ways. Uh, keep in mind, since we're saying it's a fundamental equation like Newton's second law, yes, if you work with this equation and you, again, plug in big objects, it simplifies to Newton's second law and our conservation of energy equations and all of that stuff we had last semester. We are by no means going to show how any of that works, okay? So don't let that stress you out. On the other hand, if I take this to the next level and I take the absolute value or the magnitude of that function, the wave function, and square it, just accept this, it gives you this weird additional information. It doesn't now say, like, ooh, where is the electron at a certain time? Now it gives you the probability of the electron being in a certain position at a certain time. Again, the idea of quantum mechanics, a lot of it is like, uh, things are waves. They're a little fuzzy. I, I can't really say exactly where a wave is, right, because it's a wave. It's inherently spread out a little bit. Well, that means that for all objects at the quantum level, they're a little spread out a bit, and I can't say it's right there. Instead, it's highly likely it's in this location, but it could be somewhere a little bit different. This particular function and calculation allows us to calculate that probability. Yes? No. No. Sorry. Yeah. Question over? Yes. Yeah. All of that. Yep. So those electron cloud equations are basically solutions to the Schrodinger equation. It's just generally chemistry just skips over that part. Yeah. Why do we care about time? Um, it's the same thing as if I were to ask, uh, like, where are you? We need to add to that. Well, when? Right now you're here, but an hour ago you were somewhere else. Like, to give full coordinates, we need both position and time to define the location. Anybody else? So let's tie this back to that double slit experiment from a chapter or two ago. Uh, I told you a little bit about the fact that it works with light, but it also works with electrons, even if the electrons are sent through one at a time, meaning that it's like, ooh, there's two slits, I'm going to shoot an electron, and then what happens is there's a little dot that's made on the screen where the electron essentially landed. 
And then you wait an hour, and you shoot another one, and then, like, another little dot is created. You're like, great, this is fantastic. I'm shooting electrons at two holes, and it's making dots. And it really, one electron at a time, seems quite random. Like, I don't really know where the dots are going to appear, and especially when it's at this stage, they're just kind of scattered all over the place. It, like, it's almost like, like the electrons go, and maybe they, like, clip the wall just a little bit on the way and sometimes bounce over to one place. Sometimes they go perfect. It, it kind of feels like that's what's happening, even though it's not, because they're just sort of hitting the screen all over the place. If you were to repeat the experiment and be like, okay, I made it that far, like, let's just start over at this point, you'd get a different result, meaning it's not like these little dots appear in the same order every time. Like the first one you shoot through doesn't always appear there. Next time you do the experiment, the first one might appear over there. It really does seem totally random and non-reproducible, okay? We also learned that over enough time, if I shoot enough electrons through there, eventually we exhibit this interference pattern, which seems to imply in some way that like the electrons of the past and the future knew what we were trying to do, and they've decided, like, ooh, I know where I need to land on the screen to, like, build this interference pattern to fake them into thinking I'm a wave when I'm really not. But that's kind of what's happening and kind of not what's happening, okay? This thing, psi squared, or the absolute value or magnitude of psi squared, predicts this. It is a probability function, and if you solve that for, like, different positions, if you get a zero for the probability, it exactly tells you the location of where the center of these dark bands are going to be. There is zero probability that an electron can land there based on that solution to the wave function. On the other hand, if I find places where there's a maximum in the wave function, that predicts the central parts of the light bands. So it's highly likely that an electron is going to land in those locations. So there's math behind what's happening here that allows us to calculate that interference pattern without just being like, it's magic. Like we can with great accuracy and using probability functions describe the regions where it's likely or not likely for an electron to be. Are you okay? Yeah, a little bit, maybe, maybe not. So we gotta ask you a question, like if we're literally doing this one at a time, why does it go where it goes? Like, it's not like, like it can know the future and the past, and it really doesn't seem like a particle can interfere with itself in some way. It's a particle. If I take one ball and throw it at the wall, like that ball can't do something to itself to make it go somewhere else. Like it needs some interaction with something else for anything to happen. So here's the weird thing. If we were to do the exact same experiment, and there's two slits, and like maybe for the first half of it, I cover one, and then I know that all the electrons during that period of time were going through the left one. And then for the second half of the experiment, I decided to cover the other one, which means I know that for that part of the experiment, they were going through the right one. Well, then the end result, it turns out, is not like this. Let me show you what that would look like. You will end up with something that kind of looks roughly like this. In other words, big bright regions directly behind both of the slits which kind of makes sense, but also disagrees with everything that was happening before. So notice, um, here's the thing. If I keep both holes open, the electron behaves like a wave. In a way, it's like it gets to the two holes, but if it's a wave and literally spread out a little bit and not a particle, it's like, fine, two holes, I'll just go through both of them, right? You can imagine that happening if you're not thinking of an electron as a dot, but as something that's sort of spread out. But on the other hand, if I force it to go one way or another, then it goes through one of the holes, makes a single dot on the screen, and acts like a particle. So even more at this point, this starts to illustrate that the electron sort of changes its behavior based on how I interact with it. It's simultaneously both and neither all of the time, and that's a little strange. Okay, so to summarize this a little bit before we get to the next part, which I enjoy a little too much, the wave happens, uh, or if it's a wave, we can use just the wave function, and it tells me like the amplitude of the wave, 
if I want to look at a particle, I can take the absolute value of that and square it, and it gives me the probability of where the particle is going to be located. So you start to see that this idea that quantum physics is creating, the math, is dealing with both. Like, at the same time, I have an equation that allows me to deal with the wave stuff and the particle stuff and not get creeped out by it, but just say, hey, I've got math, and it'll solve both possibilities. So that's kind of nice, all right? So what if I observe which slit the electron goes through? In other words, if I were to keep both of the slits open, but instead, I, I don't know, let's, let's draw a picture. Mm, here's a slit, and here's another slit. And then, how did you guys tell me to draw eyeballs? Like, something like... Ooh, that's Pac-Man. Sorry, I lost it again. Well, I, mm. That's... And then they, what? Like this? Yeah. I don't like that at all. That just bothers me. Uh, like this, and then that, and then you draw some <laughs> eyelashes. Okay. It really looks terrible in every way. All right? So, in other words, observe which slit the electron goes through. So, if you want to think about that, it's like, you know, two people that are like, okay, I'm going to watch. If an electron goes through my side, I'm going to see it and raise my hand. You can't really do that. Instead, some sort of electronic detector, like on the slit, that maybe it, like, lights up when it sees an electron go through there, okay? Do you see that we're changing the experiment a little bit? You can watch this YouTube link later. I uh, know it's not going to work, so why bother? It's only like 15 seconds long, but it's not going to work, okay? So here's what happens if you do this and keep both slits open. On your screen, you get this instead of the full interference pattern. It basically just piles up behind both slits. In other words, that forces it to behave like a particle. Not by closing one slit and the other, simply by making the observation and knowing whether it's in one slit or in the other. I see a few of you that are going, because you're a little creeped out by that idea. Yeah? So will you see actually affect how the electron behaves? Yeah. Think about how you see. How do I see anything? How do I see you right now? Light. Comes to my eye, but what did it do before it came to my eye? It bounced off you, right? For me to make any observation at all, you have to interfere with the object in some way. Now, if I bounce a light wave off you, it really doesn't affect you. It's not like you're like, oh, I moved, you know. No real big deal. But if I bounce a light wave off of an electron, ooh, uh-oh, like they're both kind of down there in the same regime together, like I've made an impact by making an observation. So it's not as creepy as just like, I'm just going to sit back and watch and not let like hide, like I saw you, electron. No, no, like there is a physical interaction that's happening there by making the observation. So maybe that's not quite as weird as it seems at first look. So... If I take these away and don't make the observation, the electron could be anywhere. In other words, it's a wave. Like, it just gets like, oh, I'm going to float through both of the slits. If I do make the observation and I know exactly where it is, then the interpretation is that it's a particle. This is what's known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it leads to a lot of weirdness. In fact, Schrodinger himself hated this whole idea and proposed this thing to fight, fight against it, which is quite disturbing. I'm going to try to explain this, and that's how we're going to end today, and we'll finish up the last couple of slides on Monday. Um, Schrodinger's cat-in-a-box thought experiment fought with this idea a little bit, and it's an idea that if you have a macroscopic object, which typically isn't impacted by quantum mechanics, but I rig an experiment so that its entire existence is dependent on what's happening at the microscopic level, what's going to happen. And here's the way it works. We're going to take a little tiny, tiny bit of radioactive substance and put it in the box with the cat, okay? The box is sealed. I can't see the cat anymore. I can't see the radioactive substance. And somehow we're going to have to, like, uh, I don't know, like put like something here to keep the cat from going over there and eating the radioactive stuff, like keep him away from the apparatus, all right? And let's say there's such a small bit of radioactive substance that in the course of an hour, there might be one emission, okay? So it's really a tiny bit, one 
little alpha particle leaves and goes out. And I don't know when it's going to happen. It's completely random. It could happen at any time in the course of an hour, but it's so slow it's only going to happen once. All right? If the little particle of radioactivity comes out of here and hits this Geiger counter, the Geiger counter says, ding, ding, I have registered a particle, and it is connected to this hammer, and the hammer falls and breaks a vial of poison. Okay? So you can see we've gone from something tiny in the microscopic world, and we've almost like scaled it up such that if that little microscopic event occurs, well, then a macroscopic thing happens, poison is broken, and the cat dies. Do you understand the experiment, first of all, without interpreting it in any way? Okay? So let's say we rig all of this up, put the cat in the box, seal it. We can't hear what's happening inside. We don't know what's happening. We just know in the course of an hour the radioactivity might happen or it might not happen, and we don't know when it's going to happen. This is sort of the equivalent of not making an observation and the electron could be anywhere. It could be about to go through one slit or the other. It's kind of doing both at the same time, which means that as long as I don't make the observation and look in the box, the cat might be dead, the cat might be alive. We could theoretically say it's kind of both because I don't know which one it is. I don't know which slit the electron went through. I don't know whether the cat has died or not. It's simultaneously dead and alive, weirdly because it's connected to this microscopic event that may or may not have occurred, all right? Schrodinger said just because he could come up with this, that this whole thing must just be bogus. Like, if I can invent a situation like this, then describing quantum physics in this way doesn't make any sense. But alas, this weird experiment is now sort of used as the benchmark, okay? When new ideas on quantum physics come out and people are like, well, maybe this model fits what we're seeing. People go back to this experiment and sort of see how the new ideas would affect this experiment, and it helps them decide whether the new ideas are completely valid or completely invalid or whatever, even though he really never meant it to be this way. Also, I don't think anyone's ever actually done this. Please don't, because that would be sad and bad. And also... You don't really want to put cats into a state where they're simultaneously dead and alive. I don't think they like that. They don't really like anything, though, do they, when it really comes down to it? Uh, we talked about this cat. The cat's dead and alive. I kind of said my piece on that. I, I don't really have anything else to add to the cat. Instead, we've got two slides left here that really build on everything we've been saying about uh, wave particle duality and how that impacts our observations and what we know and what we don't know. And this is really all stated mathematically in the form of something known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which, I don't know, the uncertainty principle. I kind of like that in the sense, like, I don't really know anything. Like, everything's a little hazy, a little uncertain. But mathematically, it speaks in terms of things we've talked about, position and momentum. And it says that we cannot simultaneously know both exactly. We cannot simultaneously know the exact position and momentum of a particle. Uh, this is built up based on everything we've talked about, about things being waves and particles simultaneously, and also the idea that I have to interact with something to observe it. And I want to give you two different examples of this. The first one is, let's say, a ping pong ball in the dark. What if we turned the lights out in here and made it really, really dark, and one of you hit a ping pong ball somewhere, and then all of you were tasked to f find it? In other words, make an observation of the location of the ping pong ball. Not going to be terribly easy. If it's completely pitch black in here, maybe you decide, okay, I'm just going to walk around with my finger out and just hope that, like, I, I will sense the presence of the ping pong ball when I find it. And maybe you're sent in one at a time so you don't go around like poking eyes out and stuff. That'd be kind of terrible. Plus also, like, I don't know, like maybe then you could tell like, oh, I touched something. It was really, really light. It felt sort of plastic and I felt it run away because I pushed it away, right? So you know when you found the ping pong ball. But what happened when you found it? 
Huh? You, you changed things about it, right? First of all, maybe it was moving by, and then you found it. Oh, you changed its velocity and changed its momentum. Also, maybe you found it, but then you pushed it. Now where is it? Alas, you don't know. you got to go find it again. Okay? Those two things are interacting. If I've located its position at one point in time, immediately I now don't know its momentum. Whatever it was doing, it's doing something different. But simultaneously now, it's like, uh, I've got to go off and find it again. These two things, velocity or momentum and position, are affecting each other. If I make an observation, I affect both of them in a way. So what if we scaled that down to, say, an electron? And we're trying to observe it with light. We talked about this a little bit on Friday, I think. If I'm going to try to make an observation of an electron and decide, like, ooh, I want to know if this electron goes through this slit, the only way I can make an observation is by bouncing something off of it and seeing what comes back. Typically, we might use light. Maybe we use another electron. We use something to interact with it. And as soon as I do that, it's like, oh, I know it was in this slit. Where did it go? I don't know. I've just pushed it somewhere else at the same time. So... Because of these things, because I'm dealing with a wave particle and I have to interact with the object to make an observation, we have a fundamental limitation on how well we can perceive things when we're dealing with the quantum level. Now, it doesn't make a lot of difference if we get terribly macroscopic. The ping pong ball is a reasonable example because it's really light. But if you were like two people in the room and you were tasked with finding a friend in the room, like by going around and like, where are they? Like as soon as you like bump into them, like you're probably not going to shove their position too much. And you'll be like, ah, 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 I found you, right? Like if they're macroscopic enough, well, maybe our perception isn't terribly limited. But as things get smaller and lighter and lighter and really, really light and small, all of a sudden we have some issues. So if we were to express this mathematically, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle looks like this. And I'm going to express it in one dimension. So we'll say delta x, which is like how well we know its position. So think of it as an uncertainty in the position. Okay? Where is it located? Times delta p in the x direction. So specifically it's momentum uncertainty in the x direction. Has to be greater than or equal to... Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, which I understand seems a little weird without deriving any of this. feels like I'm just putting letters together and making stuff up. Keep in mind that Planck's constant is really, 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 really small. Okay, So this is a tiny uncertainty and really only comes into play mathematically if I'm dealing with tiny, tiny things. Okay. Also, if I were to rearrange this, uh, let's see. Let's solve for the uncertainty in the momentum. So we've got something that looks like that. What happens to my uncertainty in the momentum if all of a sudden my uncertainty in the position approaches zero? Mm, yeah. If your uncertainty in one thing approaches zero, then the uncertainty in the other thing is approaching infinity. So you can start to see how those interplay mathematically. Now let's put uh, some brackets around that. It's kind of like an example. Questions? Does anybody watch lots of sci-fi things? So you can admit it. I do. Love sci-fi in general. I know there's a few of you out there. Some of you are like, some people will think it's not cool. It's cool. Just deal with it. All right? Um, if you watch enough Star Trek, at some point through the series, you might have noticed them referring to something known as a Heisenberg compensator. Uh, I remember hearing this the first time. I just kind of noticed as it flashed by. I was like, Heisenberg compensator? <laughs> I know what they're trying to do there. The Heisenberg compensator was in the transporter, like the transporter where they had to figure out all the little particles of the person, turn them into energy, and then put them back together. Well, clearly that's a little bit of a problem if you don't know exactly what all the particles that make up a body or an object are doing due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So they invented something that's kind of based on real stuff, right, as a way to explain the limitations of the physics and get beyond it. So the Heisenberg compensators overruled the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and let them build transporters. You just don't care, do you? 
Like, but now you'll listen for things maybe. Uh, they also had inertial dampeners. Anybody remember hearing about the inertial dampeners? No? Okay, that's fine. It's because they could jump at warp speed without everybody going, ah, and dying by being pushed back again. They didn't feel it at all. They were just like, yay, we just jumped to light speed, and everything is fantastic. You know, they didn't feel it. They didn't feel the inertia. <sighs> you people are no fun. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Our perception is limited at the quantum level. So if you're thinking like, well, I don't live on the quantum level. Who cares? Maybe my uncertainty and precision is fine. Just keep in mind that all of the stuff you interact with on a daily basis, all the macroscopic things, are built on things that have inherent uncertainties in their location and positions. So does all of that just go away at the macroscopic level? Uh, who knows? Which is where this often leads into a philosophical discussion of a war between these two ideas. Determinism versus this whole probability uncertainty kind of thing. Um, you might think of this as like a debate over free will. Do we actually get to decide what we're going to do? Or is there all of this just like, eh, I don't know, stuff's happening, like we can't really pin anything down. And if you're wondering, like, how in the world do we get from electrons to all of this, just pick up any popular science book that deals with quantum physics off the shelf in the library, and there'll be an excellent discussion. And it'll just kind of like let your brain go all the places, and you'll have all kinds of fun, and I'll let you do that. So determinism. Determinism is based on everything we talked about last semester, basically. Essentially, if I look at a particle of any type, and I know its position, and I know its velocity, and I know the forces on it, well, then I can say exactly where that thing is going to end up later. We essentially did that with two-dimensional kinematics, and then we did it with Newton's laws. We said, like, ooh, I know what the acceleration is going to be. I know where it's going to be located. I know everything if I know the current state of the object. So... We could also, like, repeat experiments, like I could take a projectile and say, a certain angle, a certain velocity, it's going to land in the exact same place every time. I can say if I repeat the experiment, I'm going to get the exact same results. Well, that works for the most part, but the thing is, quantum physics is trying to say that none of that works. I can't know the current position. I can't know the velocity. I can't know for certainty where it's going to be in the future and what it's doing. And if I do the same experiment... It won't necessarily do the same thing. Remember the little dots that are happening when the electrons go through the double slit? They build that pattern in a different order every time. So I don't really know that the experiment's going to proceed the same way. So these are like polar opposite ideas. One, I know everything. The other, I don't really know anything. I just maybe know some likelihoods of things happening, which is a, a little bit disturbing, right? You're driving down the street and you think, you know, like, as long as I go at this velocity and I go in this direction, I'm not going to hit that building. Well, that, there's a high probability of that, but based on quantum physics, maybe there is a very, very small probability, but not zero likelihood that if you do that a thousand times, one of the times you hit the building, even though you didn't go that way. Well, that would be a creepy world in which to live, right? The thing is, that un probability is not zero, it's just really, 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 really small. I said small. Small. There, small. Okay? So, all of these laws that we have, Newton's laws and all the ideas of things happening a certain way, they're not really laws. They're just really, really high probabilities. We have to kind of change our way of thinking about the world and the universe at large. Everything is in terms of probabilities. And that's really all I want to say about the philosophy of this. Before I make one more point, and then we're going to talk about relativity, as if this wasn't weird enough. Any questions about Heisenberg or any of this? Yeah. So, are you, did you say that from the macroscopic object, we can't know for sure in, in all of this? We, it's deterministic for all intents and purposes. Like, things are going to happen a certain way. But it's not impossible that things could go another way than what we predict. Even for macroscopic? Even for macroscopic. It's just really, 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 really unlikely. Okay? Now, one last thing. And uh, the textbook I was reading, like, to kind of try to get these ideas in my head, I thought it was interesting. Like, at the end of some of this discussion, they go back and they make this point that I decided was kind of important to make overall. Because, like, we've been trying to describe things with quantum physics, like, using things like this. It's like, ooh, 
An electron exists at a certain position and at a certain time. Like we can describe what it's doing. And we've almost pretended that by using that wave function thing that we can like do that. We still kind of can't. This is just the language we use because it's the language we understand. We understand positions, times, velocities, projectiles, paths, motion. We understand all of that. So we do our best to describe what happens in the quantum world using our experiences, our language. But I want you to remember that like when we talk about that double slit thing, hmm, and there's a screen over here, and then all of a sudden there's an electron, like we want to think of it as like, ooh, I know where it is, and I know what time it was there. And then maybe if it ended up here, like it followed this exact path and did something like that. We can't really think about things that way. All of it is like, well, it's kind of here doing something, and then something kind of happened along the way, and then some stuff happened, and then, ooh, it made a dot. It's really imprecise, and it's wrong to think of it as following a certain path. In fact, we really can't know anything about how the electron got from point A to point B. We just kind of know the end results a little bit, all right? So you might even extend this to say that an electron or other microscopic particles don't really live in a position time world the way we do. They have a different experience and to try to nail them down and describe them in terms of positions and times is completely incorrect. They have their own thing going on. And if we could go down there and experience it, maybe we would understand it, but alas, we can't, so we don't. End of story. Chapter 7, done.